moment in our academic calendar each year, one of the seminal moments in our life with the community each year. But before we get to the main event, I wanted to take just a moment to acknowledge that it's been another tough week in America. Uh, we have friends, colleagues, and loved ones connected to Michigan State University and or El Paso, Texas. And I don't know about you all, but what happened at Michigan State hit a little too close to home for me. Oh, Michigan oh. State is a bigger campus, of course, but it's 200 miles away, and I'm sure in, in many ways very similar to our community. And so I want to start this evening by acknowledging that another campus community right now is going through a lot of pain and hurt and recognize them with a moment of silence and prayer. Thank you very much for that. It's never the way you want to start the evening, but it does make tonight's topic all the more important. Mm -hmm. The leaders we need now. And let's talk about need in our society and the leaders we will need. This is such a topic that we need to dig into. And so it's all the more important that we're here this evening. Now, speaking of leaders that we needed, this is a lecture series named in the honor of President Emerita Kathy Krendel, who was our president until yours truly showed up and tried to fill those <laughs> shoes as best I could. I don't quite fit in them, though. And so uh, Kathy's legacy, if you are new to Otterbein, many students, you might not have been here when she was here. Her legacy is all over this campus and all over this region. Kathy believed in access and affordability and brought that mission to Otterbein. Her vision brought us the point, this amazing place for workforce development and experiential learning that we get to show up every day, started with this woman right in front of us right now. And she helped Otterbein own the women's leadership space. We were founded as the first college, founded co-ed in the country. She, as our first woman president, brought that to bear in her legacy here at Otterbein. So Kathy, I'd like you to stand for a second yes. and recognize. Thank you so much for coming down. Now I have the great honor and may I say difficult duty of trying to introduce Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. This is no small task because a simple Google search will give you reams and reams of information. So I only have 10 pages to read to you tonight. <laughs> now I decided to skip doing it quite that way and just tell you that she spent five terms in the Ohio House of Representatives where she was known for fighting to bring financial literacy and STEM education to our K through 12 schools where she fought to make sure that uninsured and underinsured women who had cervical or breast cancer would have access to health care. And she took her great energy to the United States Congress in 2013, where she has an even longer list of accomplishments, some of which include helping to shepherd Katanji Brown Jackson, now Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman on the United States Supreme Court, through the process as one of her great advocates. She was the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus for the 117th Congress. She was instrumental in bringing together the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill and making Juneteenth a national holiday. Most importantly, you need to know about her that maybe not a lot good happened out of Ohio's redistricting, but one thing, and that is the Congresswoman is now Otterbein's member of Congress, so we're thrilled about that. <laughs> So rather than the full bio, I thought actually, let me tell you just a short story of the first time I had the pleasure of meeting Joyce Beatty and see if she remembers this. I had been at Otterbein fully six months, new to Ohio, didn't know my way around anything, and I was invited to sit at the dais at the MLK breakfast in Columbus. Now this MLK oh, breakfast is a big deal. It is the biggest MLK breakfast in the nation. Yes. And being on the dais is, is, you know, you're with the movers and shakers. I will say my proudest moment of that morning was 
I, I was having a very nice conversation with a man named Dave, and we were getting along quite well, and I eventually, midway through the conversations, asked, and what do you do? And he said, I'm the Attorney General of the state of Ohio. And I said, oh, you to Ohio, I'm figuring this stuff. He was very polite about it. At the end of the breakfast, Joyce Beatty beelines over to me, grabs me by both shoulders, not one shoulder, both shoulders, and says, you're the new president of Otterbein. And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> and she said, I've been waiting to meet you. I love Otterbein. That's true. And I said, Congressman, we love you right back. And she said, we need a selfie. And so we immediately got shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, and took a picture together. And that tells you what an engaging, friendly, committed, dedicated, energetic representative we are lucky to have in Congress and we are lucky to have with us tonight. After the Congresswoman's remarks, I am also pleased to do a pre-introduction of Debbie Johnson, Otterbein class of 84. Oh, you had to say the date. Some Q and A. Uh, Debbie is uh, the founding director of the Los Ross Leadership Institute and the former mayor of Upper Arlington. We're lucky to have her as an alum to facilitate that. And all of you students, start preparing great questions and play Stump the Congresswoman here in just a second. Without further ado, please welcome Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. You are amazing, <laughs> Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, good evening, and thank you so much. What a wonderful introduction. And to answer that question, yes, I remember it, Mr. President. I remember it like yesterday. He was so charming and so delightful, but he looked very new and in a new place. And so I hope we welcomed you as much as you have welcomed me and all of my colleagues to this wonderful university. So let me say to the audience tonight, thank you. Thank you for being here to the students, to the Westerville community, to the faculty, and those who just were told they had to be here. We're gonna make this evening fun and challenging because it's important for students to have the understanding of what does it really mean when someone says, the leaders we need now. I want you to think about that. And we're gonna have that conversation about that. And then I'm gonna have the opportunity to sit and have a dialogue and let you ask questions. But I am here tonight in part, Mr. President, because of you and this wonderful university. I'm also here because it is now in my district and it gives me great pleasure to be here as your Congresswoman. But then I am really here because it is a lecture series that's named after a friend, named after a legend, a living legend. I'm not here because I'm just on the program for the lecture series. I'm here because Kathy is a friend. I knew her, Mr. President, when she was Madam President and had the opportunity to work with her, to witness her receive all kinds of awards and acknowledgments. So Kathy, I am not surprised that now there is a lecture series named after you. Now you know, people get very jealous. And earlier at dinner, I said, well maybe if I leave Congress, there could be a lecture series named after me. John leaned over and said, but you have to be president of Otterbein. So Kathy, I guess the next le lecture series will be named after John. <laughs> but I will come back as long as you ask me. And so many friends here, I have a colleague and a friend, uh, State Representative Mary Lightbody, where are you? We are also in her house district, thank you for all the work and your leadership that you do. It means a lot to us. Thank you. Well, by now you know that I am Congresswoman Joyce Beatty and I represent the third congressional district. And I have the opportunity to be home this week. And home is where everything happens. So tonight, what are we gonna talk about? We have the scene set by giving us the title, but I would like to say 
that if you're gonna figure out the leaders that we lead, need now, what does that mean? So first to the students, because tomorrow a professor might ask you something. So let me give you four words that you can give back to them uh, to make sure that they know you were here and you were paying attention. So first, we need leaders who can lead. We need leaders who can listen. We need leaders who want to leave a legacy like having the Kathy Grindle lecture series. We need living legends, and that's where you come in. So often when we talk about leadership, we talk about those whose shoulders that we stand on, and that's very important. But I'm gonna tell you what my nine-year-old grandbaby said to me. She said, Grammy, you give all these speeches about leadership and leaders, and I was getting really excited. And then she leaned in, as a nine-year-old can do, she said, Grammy, but they're all dead. She said, can we talk about people who are living? Can't you talk about people who are doing things now? Because that's the kind of leaders I need to know about. Someone I can go listen to and see and talk to. And that was an eye opener for me. So every time I talk about the legends and the shoulders that we stand on, I immediately pivot to talk about what's happening in the world today, to talk about who are those leaders that we have now, because that's what we need to talk about. That's what we need to focus on. So when you think about the series tonight, and you think about Kathy being a living legend, you think about her work not only as a president, which takes up a lot of time, but we, Think about the things that she did that were so innovative. We think about the service that she provided to the community. We think about how strategic she has been and continues to be every day. Kathy, you are a national leader. People come far and wide to participate in this lecture series because of you. And that's important for students to know because we need a you. As a student, we need you to know that there can be a lecture series about you. We need you to know that nothing is impossible. When I was coming up, everybody was gonna basically be the same thing. You know, if you went to college, you were gonna be a teacher or a nurse. No one said that you could be the college president. No one said that you could be the surgeon when I was coming up. And now today, we think of all of the things that we are going through in this complicated, this complex time now in our country. If we just take COVID-19, no matter what you think about it, something existed. Things shut down, schools were modified in their plans, we wore masks, we couldn't sit together, and we did not necessarily understand this complex, virus. But to the students, Dr. Kizzy Corbett, a young, young scientist, was a researcher in helping us determine what those vaccinations could be. Nobody ever heard of her probably before then, unless you sat next to her in the classroom. So to the students, one of you can be that researcher, that college president, that member of Congress, that vice president, or that president. That's where we start with the leaders we need now. We need people to want to know that they have a vision that they can share and that people will listen to them. Now lastly to the students, remember this phrase. A teacher said it to me and said, was that provocative? Did it make you think about something? And the phrase went like this. Education is like a boat heading upstream against the river's current. If it's not moving forward, it will be drifting and left behind. We need leaders who are moving forward. We don't need leaders who are drifting because they will leave us behind. We need leaders that believe they can do something even when the odds are against it. 
Now, to some, maybe these are only words. So let's start with what kind of leader am I? See, I think when you ask the question to someone, you have to be able to defend it. You have to be able to talk about it. So let's take a younger Joyce. You know, earlier today I said, Joyce, if I were talking to self about what I wanted to say to this audience to now, to make them think, I can't give you the answer, but I can give you stories about what I think and things that happen that will hopefully pull us together to say, this is the kind of leader I want whether that is the leader of the free world, whether that is the leader that's running an institution, a university, a church, a community, when you put it all together, that's what makes us understand a movement. So self said back to Joyce, about 12 o'clock noon today, you're gonna have this audience of diverse and amazing people, some people who have never heard you, some people who have maybe heard you before. And then you're gonna have a president, the president of Otterbein is gonna get up and introduce you and say all these amazing things. And then you're gonna to have to get up there and give a speech. What do you think people want to hear? So I thought, rather than just lecture, no offense to the faculty and the teachers I was once one, let me tell them a story about what I think makes up the kind of leaders that we need now. I had only been in Congress for a month or so, and I decided that I wanted to be a leader that would lead. So I knew I had to listen. I wanted to be a leader that could leave something. So young girls and young men and older folks will say, oh yeah, I remember that Joyce baby. Now she did this, this, and this. So I get an invitation to go to the White House. Now, I don't care what your political party is because the first time I went to the White House, Ronald Reagan was the president. And the next time I went to the White House, Bill Clinton was the president. And let me tell you what, I did the same thing for both. I bought a new dress and I got my hair done <laughs> and I got excited. So it doesn't matter. I got invited to the White House by our house leader to review the speech that the President of the United States was going to say at the State of the Union, our first black president, me, a freshman in Congress. I did the same thing. I got my hair done and I put on a new suit. And then I realized it was a little more than that because I was a U.S. Congresswoman. And so when I got there and I sat at the table, there were five other women. And before the president's team came in, they said, our job is to review his speech and let him know as leaders what we thought. Oh my God. I'm going to be able to tell my grandchildren and children that I helped write the president's speech. So they come in and they lay down the folders in front of us. They're in this black leather binder and they give each one of us the folder. I had my good pen out and I turned the page. It was like taking an exam in college. And I start reading, okay, okay, okay. I got here, circled that, don't know what that word means. Turn the page here and I'm on page like maybe five. There are 12 pages. And come on, I, I think I'm a pretty good reader. And everybody else is sliding their portfolios back across the table. I'm only on page five. I'm looking, and then I'm getting that look that your parents give you. Like, oh, okay. So I close it up, I slide it back across the table. Very confused. Like, I'm only on page five of 12. And so then they say, thank you very much for coming and reviewing uh, the president's speech. I hope you enjoyed having the opportunity. Hand goes up, you know, I'm a freshman. I, I'm like, excuse me, uh, but I had two things that I wanted to tell you that uh, I had a question about on page five, and I didn't get to the rest of the page, uh, so I'd like to know, can I have extra time? And they're looking at, then I look up, and they're giving me that look like, mm, 
<clears throat> and everybody knows what that means. I'm still confused, so you know what I do? I say it louder, like they couldn't hear me. I say, no, 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 for real, for real. I don't, by this time, the president is standing there. I said, oh, Mr. President. And at this time, everybody's saying, thank you, Mr. President, thank you, Valerie Jarrett, thank you, we're happy to be here. And so the president said, you have something else to say? And I said, well, actually, yes. <laughs> I said, there's not enough things. I said, matter of fact, Mr. President, there's not anything in here about women. And all week on TV, I'm getting ready to get all into it, you know. I said, and all week, you've been talking about the women's movement and women and women in your cabinet. And at this point, the people who brought me were standing up and saying, getting ready to apologize for me. And so the president looked at me and he said, thank you and have a good day. And as we left to get in the car, it was silent. They were so upset at me. I started to doubt myself. I started to feel like, what kind of leader am I? But then I turned and I said, well, self, I think you were telling the truth. Self, you were asked to come here and tell the president what you thought. So we got in the car. Now to get from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue all the way down to the Capitol, not one word, not one word to me. No one looked up. Everybody was just sitting there like they were in disgust. So I don't tell anybody. I'm just hoping it goes away. The next day, all dressed up in my owl seat, waiting for the man to come and say, and now the President of the United States of America. They do that, President Obama comes down the aisle, he shakes my hand and everybody's hand, he gets up into the well to give his speech. On, and at that point, they give the members of Congress a, a hard copy of the speech. Across about two rows over there, one of the women, Rosa Delora, who was in the meeting said, Beatty, look at the top of page 11. What I had said to President Obama was, when women succeed, America succeeds. As I was going out the door, I said, and that's what you ought to say. Page 11 top, the President of the United States says, when women succeed, America succeeds. Everybody starts saying, Joyce told him to say that. Didn't we, Joyce? <laughs> but I went with it. I said, we did. We met with the president. Because you see, I could have said, no, I said this, I did that. That's not the kind of leaders we need now. We need leaders who will listen, tell the truth, have confidence and courage, but yet the compassion that you don't need to brag and say everything that you did because your work, as Kathy has done, will be all the evidence that you need. And how does that become transformational to where we are now? So then you think, eight years later, a president running says, I will pick a vice president of these United States that's female. And he did. Our first female, a black American, to serve as vice president of these United States. To have, as you mentioned, John, to have in the highest court, the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court, Katanji Brown, Jackson sitting in the Supreme Court. The type of leaders we need now. We need leaders who are diverse. We need leaders who will understand what this generation of leaders, how they learn, how they look at things. We need leaders that will lead and listen. But more importantly than the leaders we need now, we need the communities, the educators, the institutions that will produce the leaders that we need now. And we have to listen to our young folks. Let me just tell you, I have an office 
of some of the brightest young folks and scholars that anyone could want to have. I have a brand new communications director and her mother's in the audience tonight. Let me just say thank you because your daughter is the type of leader that we live, need now. So thank you for being here. I have young attorneys who never wanted to practice law, Debbie, but what they wanted to do was use their legal experience. They want to talk about democracy. They want to understand defense when we talk about the world issues. They want to talk about economics and development for their future. They want to understand if I have college debt, how will I go on to be a leader? So the leaders we need now need to understand that in this wealthiest nation that we live in, that we have to be prepared for change. We have to make sure when there is an issue in Columbus, Ohio, or an issue in Michigan, or an issue in Utah, that that issue belongs to all of us. If we're going to have the leaders that we need now, we have to understand that an assault on one of us is an assault on all of us. We have to understand when we turn on our TV and we see that we have police brutality, we have to understand that all police aren't bad, but there are a few that we have to work with. When we watch and we witness in history things that just don't seem right in our gut, we have to do what my good friend, the late John Lewis said to us. If you see something, if you hear something that does not look right, then say something, do something. We need leaders today who will do that and understand. We need leaders today that understand it is not where you stand in the time of comfort and convenience, but it is the actions that you take in times of controversy and challenge. Those are the types of leaders we need today. Those leaders may be male or female, black, brown, or white, but I would like to say that I believe there's enough room in this wonderful world that we live in that there is probably a place for all of us. And that is why, as I close, going to Congress has been an amazing experience to me. But it is because I have had leaders like you, Kathy. It is because of your strategic thinking. It is because you shared yourself with so many of us that you have given me the courage, the tenacity to say on days I'm stupendous, on days I'm scatter than hell, <laughs> and on other days I'm marching with the best of them. And let me just tell you this. I had been in Congress for exactly seven days. Nelson Mandela died. It rang over the world that Nelson Mandela had died. And the US Congress, Democrat and Republican, gave great pause to salute this man and said, we should travel to South Africa for his funeral. The President of the United States, for the first time in the history, put all of our living presidents, the type of leaders that we had then, on one plane so they could travel together to Nelson Mandela's funeral. And then there was the second Air Force plane, Air Force Two. And they announced, just think about it, as you're sitting in this audience, I'm sitting in a secure room, I'm a member of Congress, and they're saying, we are going 
to Nelson Mandela's funeral. And I'm looking around, there's like 435 people sitting in there. And then they said, and there's 19 seats. <laughs> I've been in Congress for six days. And I'm looking like, I'd really like to go. And everybody said, you've been in Congress six days. They don't even know your name. You're not going anywhere. I'm like, I don't even know your name. Are you telling me where I'm not going? <laughs> but everybody knew I wasn't going. And so they sent out the announcement that 19 people had been selected to go. And this is House and Senate. So that took the numbers up another 100 people. And so we're sitting there a day before uh, the plane was to leave. And so, the leaders we leave now, John Baynard is the speaker, our good friend from Ohio. So I called John Baynard, I said, Mr. Speaker, I said, this is Joyce Beatty. I said, I represent Columbus, Ohio, and I wanna go to Nelson Mandela's funeral. And he said, what? I said, Mr. <laughs> speaker, I wanna go. He said, well, you know, they do this by seniority, Congresswoman. If it was just left up to me, I'd let you go. But, I mean, you've been here six days. He said, so it's highly unlikely that tomorrow when they leave at 4 a.m. in the morning to go out to Andrews Air Force, that you're gonna be able to get on that secure bus. Leaders lead and listen. Self said, 4 a.m., <laughs> bus leaves. This is a true story. Leaders that we need now, listen. I thought, Nobody's going to see me if I pack my luggage and I go over there in Rayburn's lobby and sit on my suitcase at 3.30. What if somebody gets sick? What if somebody doesn't show up? So I go back and I say that to my staffer and they said, well, if you're going to do that tomorrow, you better go get your diplomatic passport today. You better go over there and put your name on the security list and tell them just in case. And Speaker Boehner told you that. Because in essence, he kind of said that. <laughs> so I did that. I didn't go at 4 o'clock. I went at 3 a.m. 3 a.m., I'm sitting on my suitcase, all packed up, diplomatic passport. Got the response from his scheduler that just in case, laugh out loud. That's what they wrote. You can go. Guess what happened? They called the names to go off. Senator Cruz, also a freshman who had just been there for six days. Seat number 18, Senator Cruz. And I'm looking, seat number 19. They called out the person's name. Nobody said it. They called it the third time. I said, but I'm ready to go. I'm Congresswoman Joyce Spade. And he said, just get on the bus then. <laughs> I got on the bus. I thought I'm gonna get to Andrews Air Force and they're not gonna let me go. I get on the, on the plane. Oh, I had never been on Air Force Two. So I'm looking around and we, I mean, it's like being in this auditorium. So I make a long, long story short, I see all the names with a gold plate. And so you get to 18 and there's Senator Cruz and then there's a big door. Like, oh my God, they took 19 away because they knew that person would be here. But I'm on the plane. Now they're gonna escort me off the plane in front of all these people and they're gonna, cause people are like, what is she doing here? As you go down, what is she doing here? What is she doing? I'm the kind of leader you need now. That's what I wanted to say. They pull back the curtain and there is a junior suite. There is all of this stuff. And there is the name, the lady comes back and says, well, I guess this is yours. Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. I'm the kind of leader that you need now. I tell stories, I listen, I lead, and I love you. And just in case you didn't know, I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and I approve this message. Thank you, and God bless you. Now, am I on? Now, I, you know, I am an uh, alumni of Otterbein. I know we can do better than that. Let's give a really, really <laughs> big applause. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.
So I just have a few questions okay. for you tonight, and then we'll open it up to, to those in the audience, and we'll come around. There will be somebody with a microphone there. Um, now, one of Dr. Krendel's legacies is that she started a freshman year seminar in women's leadership. Um, I think we probably have both have, have spoken to that class. And they read, usually, women's leadership books every year. So, um, and they read one this year from the CEO of Vital Voices, um, Elise Nelson. And she said that leaders are defined, not defeated, by setbacks. Can you talk uh, about some of the setbacks you may have experienced and kind of ultimately how those enhanced your leadership? Well, you know, it's interesting because Debbie, that's kind of like asking somebody, is the glass half empty or a half full? And, and a lot of people will pause when you ask them that because they think about the setbacks. Mm -hmm. They think about being defeated. You know, I've always looked at the glass as not only half full, but half full and I'm supposed to fill it up. So I am sure in my life, like everyone, you, you've had a setback. I'm a stroke survivor. So I can't think of something that was more devastating to me than to be admitted in the hospital and wake up in a hospital room and not be able to move my right side of my body, not to be able to control my eyes or to speak, and to remember being there for weeks and weeks, but not giving up, not being defeated. Because see, I subscribe to, if something happens to you and you really can't do anything about it, you don't have to accept it in a defeatist way. You try to make the best of it. Mm -hmm. So after months of being told I would never walk again, told that I would never talk again, I think now I talk louder and slower <laughs> uh, because I store up in nanoseconds every word that I say. So I made it my new brand to be a little more animated, to use my hands, to pause, because that allows the brain to be able to store up the next words that are gonna come out without me stuttering. My husband paid a whole lot of money for that speech therapy, so y'all can clap for <laughs> me. Uh, so that's probably the biggest thing you can see. I'm, I'm walking, I had knee surgery, so if you see me limp out of here today, it's the first day I told Debbie with shoes on. But I wasn't gonna sit up here at Otterbein College and have on my orthopedic shoes. Yeah. And uh, heels she is, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, so, in, I'm very impressed. So th I think that was it. A uh, lot mm -hmm. of therapy, physical therapy. Uh, I was able to go home in a wheelchair. I ran my first election uh, from having staff pu push me around, and Mary will relate to this, that center aisle in the state house, uh, mm -hmm. I got elected in a wheelchair. And the biggest gift for me was getting an electric wheelchair. I can remember because it gave me independence. Mm -hmm. It allowed me to go on my own. Mm -hmm. I went from the electric wheelchair to braces up my legs, to flat shoes, to two-inch heels now, and a loud voice. Mm -hmm. So there Excellent. you go. Excellent. Thank you. So you're known for reaching across the aisle. Mm -hmm. um, I know Steve Stivers probably misses you quite a bit, and I you miss probably him. miss Steve, well, I'm a good friend. Um, in fact, you've been instrumental in uniting members of your own party as well as Republicans um, to pass important legislation. So how can today's leaders reach out with those with a point, uh, Opposing viewpoints, it is so divided now. It's yeah. just so so hard. And how do you, how can they bring them together to create the positive change that we need? What are some of the skills and and things that you use? Well, I think the first thing is you have to realize that you can disagree without being disagreeable. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is you have to believe in civility. And I think the third thing is I, I don't compromise on my values, my culture, uh, my beliefs they don't have to be yours. And I think the biggest mistake, if we can call it a mistake, especially in politics, is when one side feels that they are 100% right. We don't live in a 100% world. So it's okay, Steve Stivers and I probably never voted the same way. But 
his children, I'd send notes to, we'd go to each other's homes because we were friends. It didn't, it doesn't make you an enemy, whether somebody's a Democrat or Republican or whether someone's majority race or minority race, there is enough space for everything. And you get more when you compromise. So I might say to one of my colleagues, nah, I'm, there's no way that I'm going to agree on this but I'll give up this if you give up this, and then we will amend the bill, and it will be good for the American people because they don't all look like me or like you. But it, we, we've come so far, or at least I want to believe that, that in 2023, we ought to be in a world that we can at least fix the bad stuff we agree on. And we agree on people should not die because they don't have a doctor or health care. So let's agree on that. Now we're gonna disagree on how we fund it. So we have to compromise on that. We would all agree that you shouldn't have Newtown or Park Lane and a five-year-old get killed by someone who needs maybe mental health. Or you shouldn't have a police officer brutally attack and kill someone. We can agree on that. We may not agree on qualified immunity, but we can agree on where we start. And that has been my position. My position has been that we get more by working together. And I like to say I'm a problem solver. You know, it's kind of like, I'll end with this, it's kind of like Condoleezza Rice's father told her. She was very talented and they knew that at a young age to the students. And, you know, she came home and she said, oh my God, I want to be in the drill team or a cheerleader. Father looked at her and said, well, how am I going to know who you are out there? There's like 20 drill team. There's like 15 cheerleaders. He said, you need a sport or an activity where you can shine and be different than everyone else. So she became a concert pianist. She learned Russia, Russian versus Spanish or French. And so when you read books and you start reading about how you tell folks that, I thought, well, I get more attention if I fix things versus spending time to be against somebody. And, and that's kind of my motto taken from Condoleezza Rice's father that I got showcased. Now, come on. If you're an elected official or politician and they're putting you on national TV because you fixed an infrastructure bill, $1.2 trillion, a little black girl that grew up in Ohio and now gets credit. The president of the United States came here for the CHIPS Act. And he, now there's thousands of people sitting out there. The president of the United States said, we would not have had this but for Joyce Beatty. That's not all bad. Mm -mm. That might be the kind of leader you need now. Yeah, absolutely it is, absolutely. <clears throat> and obviously, uh, during your, your path, your leadership uh, journey, you've had many mentors, mm -hmm. many teachers. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe a, a few of them? Because you found them in very unlikely places, some yes. of them. Uh, the, the first one, I would say, is Charity Early. She wrote a book called One Woman's Army. And I was younger than probably any of the students in here, and she asked me to follow her one day. She heard me at some speech contest, and she was a big deal in our community. And to make a long story short, I had never seen a helicopter land on the top of the building uh, other than on TV. And so she said, come on, uh, my friend's coming here. We were on a board, going to a board meeting. At that point, I never kn knew that you could get paid a lot of money mm -hmm. from sitting on a private company's board. So to make a long story short, we went over there, we're looking up, and it was Barbara Jordan. And that was just a big deal for me growing up. And then fast forwarding, I'll give you one when I was an adult, Joanne Davison. Mm -hmm. Joanne Davison was the first speaker of the House, State House, and still to this day, the only speaker that we've ever had in the history of Ohio. And she was a legend, and I was sitting on the state house floor, and it was an issue of women's rights. She's a Republican, I'm a Democrat. And at the state house, you could pick up the mic and kind of get the press's attention and give a speech. And I gave this speech, 
and we have a green light, a red light, and a yellow light. I had never seen my yellow light come on. And so one of the pages came down and handed me a note and it says, in the speaker's office after session. And I showed it to the they said, ooh. <laughs> so I get up, and the office is amazing, and I go to the thing and I knock on the door, and there's Speaker Davidson. I mean, she was just standing there. And I said, Madam Speaker, I, I got this note. She said, have a seat. And I sat down. Now I'm a clinician by training. And so then she said, would you like a Coke? Well, nobody's going to execute you and offer you a Coke, right? And so I said, yes. Yeah. So she gave me a glass of Coke, and she sat down. She sat across to me, and she leaned in. She said, Beatty, that was one heck of a floor speech today. Thank you. And I was like, wow. She said, oh, it was so amazing. I was so proud as a female. And I mean, the speaker just said that to me. So she said, that's all. So as I got up, I took two steps and got close to the door. She said, baby. And, and so I told her, I said, yes, speaker. She said, when you go out, could you act like we had a bad meeting here? I have a reputation to keep up. So d don't go out smiling. To me. So I thought, look, I need to speak. So I walked out the door just like that. So sometime, being the leader you need now, you have to go with the flow. But she has continued to mentor and to support me. So people don't always have to think like you or look like you to be the right person for you in your time. And probably lastly, without a story, would be Nancy Pelosi, the only person in the history of this country to ever be the speaker of the House and the third most powerful person mm -hmm. if something would happen to the president. Mm -hmm. And that those are standout uh, points for me, uh, being in the room. Great. Yes, you can find them all over. And I know we've done uh, a mentor program here at Otterbein as well. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we, I was talking with uh, one of the, the mentors tonight, and they still keep in touch. So I'm going to open it up to the audience. Does anyone have a question? Who has a, do you have the microphone? We'll see if we can get a question or two. We've got about 10 minutes left. If not, I have a whole <laughs> slew of them here. Here's one right here. Hello, can you hear me? First off, I want to say thank you very much for being here, Congresswoman. I, I really appreciate everything you've talked about. And one thing I've gleaned from what you've said tonight is you were very comfortable in uncomfortable situations, to say the least. And one thing as a leader that I've found is there is times where you have very, very tough decisions to make. Can you walk me through a time where you had a, a tough decision in a very uncomfortable situation and what you learned from it? Wow. That, that's a very good question because I should have plenty of those being a member of Congress because every day I have to walk on that House floor. And sometimes you have to take a vote that your caucus tells you to take. That you don't want to take. And most of the time, we take it. But just every once in a while, you have to get enough courage to say, I just can't do that. And I can remember, um, maybe it was right before COVID, so 2019, 2018. We had this complicated bill for, a, a, a bill for folks like us that might have been OK. But for rural or poor people, it was a problem. It just one part of the bill. But I had a lady call me on the phone that day, didn't know her. And she said, I know you're going to vote on this bill. And I know the right way to vote is yes for the overall bill uh, on credit and on payday lenders, which we're all against and everything. She said, but I have a brilliant, brilliant son. And he's gotten accepted to this computer science program. But I need $3,700 to get him there and to get the laptop and that. And she said, I was told by your colleagues that I shouldn't go over to the corner place and get this loan because they were going to charge me $150. And she said, but as an adult, it's either that or prostitute myself or steal something. She said, I'm over-exaggerating this, but this is what I would do for this child who lives on this farm, 
It's never been to the big city to see an Otterbein or the Ohio State. And I don't need you to stand up on the floor and lecture me about a conscious decision to go get this loan from a loan agent versus going and getting it from a loan shark in the street. And I'd like you to stand up for rural people who don't look like you that maybe you've never thought about. And I voted no. And I got reprimanded for it. Mm -hmm. And it was the best vote I could take because that was in my mind. How many other people made a conscious decision? So I voted against the party on that. And then I went and attacked every agent, every payday lender out there that kept people captive because you do things for your children that you wouldn't do for yourself. And I got a win-win. We closed them down, we changed the interest rates, but on that day, I needed her to know there was somebody who looked like me and didn't look like her, but I would stand up for her. Yeah. Great. So thank, thank you. you. Well done, well done. Another question? Do we have any others? Did I, oh, there's a hand back there. We'll take one or two more. And I'll give a shorter answer, I'm sorry. No, you're fine, you're fine. Hello, I'm Sybil Wise, it's nice to see you. I am so excited to be here because our choir sang in your very first oh, inauguration, oh, oh, oh. and I have been following you for 100,000 years, and you are one of my serious, serious heroes, and I appreciate you being here today. I understand that your journey has been one that is absolutely incredible, but I also know that hindsight is 2020. Is there anything that you would have done differently to prepare yourself as a black woman in Congress in front of all of these people and representing the United States that would have changed your walk or something that you would have suggested that people around you do in order to make their walk even more powerful to represent like you have? Well, well first of all, let me just say thank you. And, and let me take a point of personal privilege to personally thank you. Uh, I had a bright idea uh, when I first became an elected official, well before Congress, and decided that I wanted to do something different and I wanted my own choir. Now don't ask me why, but I just envisioned being in auditoriums like this and having people that sounded like Patti LaBelle and Aretha Franklin and Beyonce march down in these long choir robes with my name down. <laughs> Maybe that's the leader you need now. Well, I threw out a wide cast and I got the beautiful voice of you. And you were amazing. So they gave me the choir, you sang, and I became just a huge hit and probably the first and only person that uh, had enough gumption to say they wanted their own choir. So thank you, I haven't seen you in a while. Um, let, let me say the only thing I would probably say back to self, and I talk to self a, a lot, it's okay as long as you don't answer. Um, I think myself would say to me, knowing what I didn't know, and, and maybe that's not all bad, I have learned so much about myself and the tenacity and the energy and the resources and the partnerships that I would have never, come on, I would have never thought about being able to say to you, I've been in 26 countries in the last five years. I've been on Air Force One too many times to count. I've been to the White, we got a call in the car today uh, saying the vice president wants you on the 27th at her home, but you gotta be with President Biden at the White House. So I don't know with the accomplishments I've been able to have thanks to people coming and listening and voting, uh, I, I don't know what I would have done differently because I didn't know enough to know what my life was gonna be like. And I don't think that's all bad. now. Parents, don't get mad at me if one of these students belong to you. I don't think you have to know the entire path that you're on because then that doesn't give you any flexibility if a great opportunity comes along. Don't ever be too afraid to tackle something that you don't know. And probably that would be the thing 
that I came to Congress later in life, and that was probably because I never thought about I would be ready to go. So when is ready? That's the first thing. So coming late, I figured I had nothing to lose. I had already been several firsts, first female Democrat period of any race or ethnicity to raise more money than anyone to lead the caucus and take over the majority and deliver the speaker. The Ohio State University at that time, the largest single campus college in the United States had never had a female of any race or ethnicity or any person of color to report to the president and the board. I was the first. Now all that sounds good, but what I know and did is never good to brag about being the first unless there's a second and a third and a fourth. If you're not paving it forward and you're just not, that's not the leader that you need. You need somebody that's gonna bring other people along. So I, I think the thing was, I didn't know enough to not know. But as I went along the road, I worked harder. This was not easy, but it was fun. It was challenging, but work. And I shared it. I, I take people along. I bring people up and give them positions, and I'm hard on them, and I make them grow into it. I've got a district director that could work anywhere. She could go anywhere. She chose to be here, and she's done an amazing job. Thank you, Terry Ifaduba. Yes. Those are the things I'm proud of, and I learned along the way. Right, and you get to sing at her first lecture series. Yeah, there you go. There we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I'm going to finish up just a little bit. Okay. The leaders we need today are more people like you. You know yourself. You listen. You ha are a great communicator. You have tenacity, and you have persistence. Thank you. So that's what great leaders need, and that's what we need today. Thank so you. Thank you. And there is one, Debbie. No, let's let's do this. Come on for yeah, Debbie. Thank you. Congresswoman Beatty, please accept the thanks of the Otterbein community for the time and insight you have shared with us tonight. The constituents of Ohio's third congressional district are fortunate to have your representation and advocacy in Washington D.C. and here at home. I know I speak for many in the audience when I say we are better for the time we spent with you this evening. You have given us ideas to consider, you have given us knowledge to harness, and most importantly, you have given us inspiration to tap into our own leadership by reminding us and helping us believe that each of us can make a difference. Okay, I didn't realize it was two-sided, everyone. Kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I was like, I'm missing a page. <laughs> I'm not missing a page. Okay. <laughs> for all these reasons and for many significant achievements as a public servant, it is my pleasure to present you with a small wow. token of Otterbein's appreciation. It is our tradition to give a blank journal to all great leaders and scholars who visit Otterbein. Oh my God. <laughs> Our hope is this, we know leaders like you need a worthy home for the ideas, the wisdom, and the possibilities you see everywhere. We hope you'll carry this journal with you to have it, as, to have it ready as the perfect place for your next great work to get started. Whether that's the start of a meaningful piece of legislation, an idea to solve a problem, or the inspiration for remarks to inspire your constituents and colleagues. We have been advancing the greater good through education and advocacy for the last 170 years 175 years at Otterbein. We are so grateful to know your leadership and service are built on the same foundation. <laughs> God, thank you. I, I just have to say this. I don't want you to think that I am just excited to be excited. But there's always a reason that something happens at a place in time. I am finishing the last two chapters of my book entitled, I Was There. And every time I go somewhere this week, I've been thinking about, oh, what's gonna be, I need a transition. And so that transition, because of you, will be the leaders we need now, and I will make reference that I'm writing the last words in the last chapters in this gift 
that was given to me on behalf of 175 years at the Kathy Bingo Lecture Series under the leadership of you, Mr. President. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you. This is so amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all for joining us this evening. This officially concludes the 2023 Crindle Distinguished Lecture. We hope to see you again for exciting lectures ahead this spring. Have a good night. Thank you. You know, we get so many claps and just I know. And I can just